Assalamu alaikum. Welcome again to our lecture series on Palestine Israel. My name is Salam al Mariadi, President of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to have a, a personal friend, a colleague, uh, and a, a great community leader, uh, Professor David Myers. Uh, David and I served together on the Leonard Beerman Foundation. Um, and uh, we've, uh, we've been friends for, for quite some time. Um, and he's helped write uh, uh, articles for uh, MPAC. And uh, we, I hope we have helped in his understanding of the Muslim community. And he's always been wonderful at uh, helping us understand the, the nuances. And today um, uh, he will be speaking on the um, history of Zionism and the thinking of Rabbi Leonard Bierman. And, and, and that's so important as we deal with this issue because Rabbi Leonard Bierman um, in 1948 went to Israel and went to fight uh, for Israel. But he came back and realized that war uh, was not the answer. And he had been an outspoken uh, uh, leader in, in the faith community, not just the Jewish community, against war, against the Vietnam War, uh, against all wars in the Middle East, the Gulf War. And to the last day, I, I'm not sure how many days that was before he died, David, but it was on Yom Kippur. Uh, his sermon was on Gaza and, and, and how the, the war against the Palestinians, the violence against the Palestinians goes against Jewish values and, and how the Jewish community needs to rethink um, it, its whole approach uh, towards the Palestinian issue. So that's why we invited David. Uh, and formally, David Myers is the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Professor of Jewish History at UCLA, where he serves as the director of the UCLA Luskin Center for History and Policy. He is the author or editor of 15 books in the field of Jewish history, including The Eternal Dissident, Rabbi Leonard I. Bierman and the Radical Imperative to Think and Act, University of California, 2018. So with that, David, thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna let you make the presentation and then we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we'll have a conversation after that. And thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you, Sal Salam, for, for inviting me and Salam Aleikum to uh, those of you who are out there. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here with you and to um, uh, share with you some thoughts about uh, the history of Zionism and the thinking of Leonard Bierman. Salam actually touched upon a couple of the points that we'll be talking about, so um, uh, that was very prescient of you, Salam. Um, I'm going to jump right in and share my screen so we can uh, begin with uh, a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Um, so um, as uh, we mentioned, uh, this is going to be um, a brief introduction to the history of Zionism. Um, and then at the end, uh, in the latter part of it, we're going to talk about uh, Leonard Bierman. So I want to begin at the beginning um, with some just uh, definitional work, um, just trying to understand what the term means. The words, the term Zionism comes from the Hebrew word Sion or Zion. Uh, which is a term mentioned in the Hebrew Bible in the second book of Samuel, uh, referring to King David's fortress in uh, the city that would come to be known as Jerusalem. In fact, on a mountainside of Jerusalem, um, uh, that uh, mountainside location is, was known as Zion or Zion. Um, and um, after the destruction of the Holy Temple, uh, the first Holy Temple in 586 BCE, before the Common Era, um, we find many references in Jewish liturgy to Zion um, and uh, indeed kind of odes and elegies um, uh, yearning to return to Zion because after the destruction of the first holy temple, uh, Jews were exiled by the Babylonians uh, to Babylon um, and many, but not all, yearned to return. And the term that they uh, conjured up and that has become embedded in Jewish liturgy uh, when they thought about return is Zion. Um, and that is one of the reasons why when a modern nationalist movement took rise in the late 19th century, um, as part of the um, wave of nationalist movements sweeping Europe in the, in the 19th century, um, the name they gave to one of them was Zionism, um, harking back to 
uh, to that uh, mountainside in Jerusalem. Um, very often, nationalist movements uh, hark back to what they perceive to be a glorious ancient past, and so too uh, this occurred in, in the case of Zionism. The term was actually uh, bequeathed to us uh, by uh, an Austrian Jewish intellectual, a very interesting Austrian Jewish intellectual by the name of Nathan Birnbaum, uh, who in 1890 came up with this term uh, Zionism or the German Zionismus. Um, and as I said, it would later become the name of a formal movement. Um, and I want to just emphasize for the moment, one of the movements of Jewish nationalism, because there are other movements uh, uh, that operated under the aegis of Jewish nationalism that um, sought solutions for the Jewish people in the diaspora. Um, what is distinctive about Zionism is its focus upon uh, uh, what was known as Zion uh, or Palestine. Okay, so we're going to move to the next slide. Um, so what prompted uh, this movement to take rise? Um, the most important catalyst or precipitant was the wave of violence that broke out um, in the wake of the assassination of the Russian Tsar Alexander II in 1881. Um, waves of anti-Jewish pogroms uh, broke out uh, across the empire uh, that sent a message to many Jews who had resided in uh, Russia and Eastern Europe for hundreds of years that uh, it was no longer a hospitable location for them to uh, to live. Um, and it set in motion a series of migratory streams of Jews, millions of Jews out of Eastern Europe, which at that time was overwhelmingly the site of the largest concentration of Jews in the world. Three quarters of the world's Jewish population lived in Eastern Europe. And this wave of pogroms set in motion um, a massive migration, uh, the largest of which went to the Americas, to the United States, where some two and a half million Jews came. Um, from 1882 or so in, to 1924 uh, into Russian cities from which Jews had previously been prohibited from settling. And a small trickle in the number of uh, single digit thousands uh, to what was known as Zion or Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, also Palestine. Um, the first waves of Zionist immigration, by which I mean modern Jews, intent on returning to Zion, as it were, um, begins in the year 1882 as part of a movement known as Chibat Zion, love of Zion, and its followers were Chovavet Zion, lovers of Zion. Um, about 25,000 um, uh, Jews from Eastern Europe uh, moved to Palestine uh, from 1882 to the end of the 19th century. Um, they were embarking on what, in, what is in Hebrew known as aliyah, uh, a word that means literally ascent, going up. Uh, because to go up to the Holy Land, uh, to, to move to the Holy Land was not only a physical movement, but a spiritual ascent. Um, and those who went were known as olin, uh, those who embark upon aliyah. Um, it's important to note that as this first um, group of uh, Eastern European Jews, and you see a picture in the top left, um, many of whom um, uh, were traditional observant Jews, and some of whom were young um, socialist nationalist upstarts. Um, so it was a, an interesting combination. Um, these people begin to make their way, the small number of people begin to make their way to Palestine before the advent of a formal Zionist movement. And the idea that they had in mind was to work the soil of the ancestral homeland in Zion, um, what they regarded as the holy soil of the homeland. But they were completely unpracticed in agriculture. And as a result, had to hire um, local native Arab laborers who were very familiar with agricultural pursuits. Um, and in some sense, this marked um, a disappointment of their original aspiration to achieve a degree of self-sufficiency um, especially through agriculture in the homeland. At the same time that uh, they are making their way from Eastern Europe to Palestine, um, in other parts of Europe, uh, Central Europe, um, we see another set of interesting developments associated with, with this figure before us, a man by the name of Theodore Herzl, who uh, was raised, uh, born in uh, Budapest in Hungary and moved uh, as a, a young, young man to uh, Vienna, where he was educated. Um, uh, his family was an assimilated European Jewish family. 
Um, and Herzl himself had relatively little uh, connection to organized Jewish life. Uh, but in the late 1880s and early 1890s, he, like so many Russian Jews, were deeply affected by a new wave and indeed spirit of anti-Semitism. In fact, the term anti-Semitism is a relatively new one. It emerges in 1879. Um, it's actually, it emerges uh, as a kind of call to action by someone intent on excluding Jews from uh, public life in Germany. Herzl became increasingly disturbed by these uh, calls to exclude or min minimize Jewish participation in uh, life in Europe. Um, and uh, the sort of epitome of uh, the pinnacle, as it were, or the abyss, one might say, of this uh, wave of anti-Jewish expression came in 1894, not in Germany, but in France, where Herzl was serving as a correspondent for a Viennese newspaper in what is known as the Dreyfus Affair, when a French Jewish army captain was falsely accused of espionage. Um, and the, uh, uh, the uproar over Captain Dreyfus became um, an international dispute with um, uh, many people in France calling for um, Dreyfus to be uh, imprisoned uh, and stripped of all military honors, and others saying this was an innocent man who was uh, accused and convicted in, in order to satisfy the interests of the state. Theodor Herzl was there in Paris observing this. He was also in Vienna before where he picked up these anti-Semitic uh, currents. And uh, in a fit of uh, kind of freneticism, he wrote a small book in 1896 called uh, the St A State of the Jews or The Jewish State in which he said the solution to the Jewish problem as he saw it in the face of anti-Semitism in Europe was to take leave of Europe um, and establish a Jewish state. This was the principle that guided him in founding what was called the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland that took place a year after the State of the Jews was published. And already at this point, we can see that there are really two tracks to uh, the Zionist movement. There's the track of settling the land um, that Russian Jewish uh, immigrants brought with them. And there was sort of the mission of creating a political state sort of by uh, engaging uh, prime ministers and kings, which was Herzl's path. And this is an important part of the story because Zionism was really born in multiplicity. There never was a single uh, Zionist uh, current. There are many different and often competing Zionist currents, and we already see two of them. But what is it that those immigrants uh, from Eastern Europe, those Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, were going to make their way to? They were going to make their way to a country that was under the control of the Ottoman Empire. Um, in fact, the Ottoman Empire had been in control of uh, that area we know of as Palestine since 1516. Um, and indeed, it would retain control over Palestine for some 400 years. Um, the Ottoman Empire at the late 19th century was a large global empire, albeit somewhat reduced from its previous glories. Uh, it covered parts of the Middle East uh, and North Africa. Previously, it extended as far uh, as Hungary and Romania in Europe. Um, and the way it operated was uh, it divided uh, the empire into administrative units, um, of which Palestine, and Jerusalem in particular, was a very small division within the larger empire. So when those Russian Jewish immigrants made their way to Palestine in the 1880s, they came under the control of the, of the Ottoman Empire. Um, what we, so too, for that matter, did the second wave of Zionist immigrants who uh, make their way f also from Eastern Europe to Palestine beginning in 1904. Um, they felt that it was very important not to succumb to the same pattern uh, as the first immigrants, the immigrants of the first Aliyah did, the first wave of immigration. They felt it was very important to achieve a degree of self-sufficiency, self to create egalitarian agricultural communities for Jews and by Jews, um, so that all of the labor would be done by them for the benefit of the Jewish collective. Uh, they really rendered sacred the task of working the soil of, of the ancestral homeland, what they regarded as Zion. Um, and it's interesting to note that the Hebrew word for physical work, uh, avodah, is the same word for worship. They sort of in, 
invested the work with a kind of sacred um, uh, mission. Um, at the same time, while they pursued this task of avodah, they were very much intent on avodah ivrit, Hebrew or Jewish labor, thereby excluding uh, the local neighboring uh, Arab landowners or uh, renters of property uh, and laborers um, with whom uh, they came into contact. Um, and oftentimes uh, they came into contact um, in, in, in moments of contention over ownership of the land because one of the things that the Zionist movement began to do um, in the early 20th century was to secure more and more land uh, for Zionist settlers through the establishment of a Palestine office of the Zionist organization, the Zionist organization that was created in the wake of the first Zionist Congress and that set up a Palestine office in order to buy land uh, for Zionist settlers. This uh, land purchase, oftentimes from absentee uh, Arab and Ottoman landowners, generated tension between the new European Jewish settlers and the native, native inhabitants of the land. Um, there are also many tensions within uh, the small circle of Zionists in Palestine. Um, and to give you a picture of how small, uh, let's take a look at this, uh, this population chart. So in 1881, uh, on the eve of the first um, wave of Zionist immigration, uh, there were about 25,000 uh, Jews who were part of the old Jewish community known as the Old Yishuv in Palestine, mainly in Jerusalem, Hebron, uh, uh, Safed, and Tiber Tiberias, four cities. Um, we estimate that there were anywhere between 450,000 and 550,000 non-Jews, um, overwhelmingly Muslim, uh, in Palestine at that time. And we see that in 1914, after the second uh, Aliyah, the second wave of Zionist immigration comes, um, the demographic balance was altered a bit, but not dramatically. Uh, there are 675,000 non-Jewish inhabitants and about 85,000 Jewish inhabitants. So. Uh, the earlier percentage of 95 to 5 is reduced uh, somewhat to 87 to 13. Um, what that makes clear is that um, Palestine was not a land without a people for, intended for a people without a land. Um, this brings us to the um, next important development in this very brief history of Zionism, which is the First World War, um, one of whose effects is to bring crashing down um, major, the major world empires that had existed prior to this point. Um, uh, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. Um, and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire coincided with and was in some sense catalyzed by the entry of the British uh, into the Middle East and into Palestine. Um, the British and a number of European powers uh, set their sights on the Middle East as a site of colonial expansion um, and uh, as part of that overall colonial expansion, uh, the British uh, issue what is known as the Balfour Declaration, uh, named after the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Arthur James Balfour, on the 2nd of November. And it's very telling what it says. So I'll read it very briefly, and then we can analyze uh, even more briefly some of the key components. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. It's important to note here uh, that the Jewish people are accorded um, a designation as a nation deserving of a national home in an era in which nationalism is very much the currency of the realm. And then we, if we continue, and we'll use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice, and here is the important phrase, the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Uh, and then goes on to say, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So it's important to juxtaposition, to, excuse me, to juxtapose um, the rendering of the Jews as a nation insofar as they are deserving of a national home, and uh, to um, the status of the non-Jewish communities in Palestine who are uh, deserving of civil and religious rights, um, not national rights, but civil and religious rights, um, a clear hierarchy in the eyes of the British. Um, and uh, it's also important to note that um, the large Arab population of Palestine is referred to as the existing non-Jewish communities, even though they represent 85 or 87 percent of the population. Um, what this helps us explain um, when we look at the Balfour Declaration is why Zionists were very pleased 
or in some instances just pleased with Lord Balfour's declaration. And uh, the Palestinian Arab population was outraged uh, by this declaration, um, which seemed to bestow upon a small minority uh, primacy of rights uh, in the land. Um, it's also important to note uh, that the language of the Balfour Declaration is included verbatim um, in the uh, mandate that the newly created League of Nations gives to the British over uh, Palestine. The League of Nations was established in order to reorder the world following uh, the First World War um, uh, and to particularly um, protect and advance the interests uh, of uh, major European colonial powers, those who actually found themselves at uh, war with one another. Um, although those who were rewarded most uh, directly in the Middle East were the British and the French. Um, what was uh, underway was an attempt really to divide the Middle East into European spheres of influence as part of uh, a project of colonial expansion. Um, Jews were, in a certain sense, um, incorporated into that larger vision, although they had their own interests, uh, which were not to serve uh, uh, the, the, the interests of the British, but to really serve the interests of the Jewish people at a very tenuous time uh, in its history. Um, when the British come into uh, Palestine, as they do in December 1917, uh, just a month after the declaration uh, by Lord Balfour was made, um, and as part of their own colonial expansion, we enter into a new uh, complicated relationship um, in the Middle East in general and in Palestine in particular. Um, a new complicated triangulated relationship that involves the British, uh, the local Palestinian Arab population, and the Jews, the Zionist uh, settlers who represent um, the interests of the Jewish community at large in Palestine or take, upon it them, take it upon themselves to do so, even though uh, there were opponents of the Zionist movement in uh, the older Jewish population that had preceded the advent of Zionism. So we can get a sense of how the interests of the three players are uh, so divergent by recognizing the, first the British aspiration to expand uh, the empire and uh, assert its interests in the Middle East. Um, the perspective of Pal the Palestinian Arab population was that uh, both the British and, for that matter, the Zionist settlers were usurpers, um, foreign uh, interlopers, intent on advancing their colonial interests um, and taking uh, what was rightly uh, belonging to the local population. The Zionists, for their part, see the Balfour Declaration as the foundation of their legal grounding. Um, uh, the legal grounding of their cause in international law. Um, and they particularly look kindly upon the incorporation of the Balfour Declaration into the language of the British mandate uh, over Palestine. Um, what we get a whiff of um, in this triangulated relationship is the specter of colonialism. Um, and it's interesting to ask, but we're not going to answer now, uh, the question, what kind of colonialism might this be? Might this be metropole colonialism in which a group of, uh, uh, of settlers are seeking to promote the interests of uh, the mothership, the, uh, a colonial power back home by extracting resources and sending them back, or might it be something akin to what is known as settler colonialism, which does not require uh, a relationship of the settlers to uh, a colonial power uh, back in a home country? Um, a question perhaps we'll take up later. Um, but what we do see throughout the 1920s, um, and certainly um, after a very um, convulsive uh, outbreak of violence in 1929, is growing tension on the ground uh, in Palestine. Um, in 1929, uh, following um, um, an attempt by um, uh, Jewish worship worshipers to, to alter somewhat the, um, uh, the choreography of ritual um, dividers um, at the Western Wall, which is the remnant of the Second Holy Temple that abuts the Haram al-Sharif, uh, the Temple Mount, uh, the holy space uh, in Islam. Um, and you can just imagine uh, the tension that existed then and now uh, as these two sites of, uh, of, uh, of holy space uh, are uh, so contiguous. Um, in the wake of that attempt to alter somewhat the uh, 
uh, uh, the ritual divider, um, violence breaks out, um, beginning initially on the Arab side, directed against the Jewish population. Um, a series of uh, pogroms break out uh, in Jerusalem that extend to Hebron uh, and up north to Safed, in which over 100 Jews are killed. Um, in response, British troops somewhat belatedly come in to uh, tamp down the violence, which um, really uh, boiled over uh, as uh, tensions between uh, Zionists and, and uh, Palestinian Arabs um, uh, had risen from 1925 until 1929 um, into this violent convulsion. Um, and belatedly, the British come in um, and put down the uh, violence um, and then undertake um, a study of the situation on the ground in Palestine, convene a commission of inquiry, which is what they typically do in such situations. Um, the commission of inquiry um, decides that uh, it would be prudent to restrict Jewish immigration to Palestine uh, as a way of calming tensions, um, which emboldens Zionist leaders on the ground to say, the British really can't be counted upon to be our allies. Um, we have to be clear about what our goal is. Our goal is the creation of a Jewish state with a Jewish majority, um, which if you remember the demography uh, uh, that I showed you, the demographic chart I showed you uh, just a minute ago, um, you can recall that that uh, required a very substantial alteration of the demographic balance on the ground. Um, and this represents really a new emboldened position on the part of Zionists vis-a-vis -vis, uh, British authorities and Palestine. Meanwhile, um, as uh, tensions continue to rise, um, we see that uh, Palestinian Arabs are organizing themselves with a new uh, degree of, uh, of order and sophistication um, into um, both political and uh, military groups. Um, and in 1936, um, we, we see an, uh, uh, the outbreak of um, what is known as the Arab General Strike or Revolt. Uh, directed against both the British mandatory authorities and the Zionists um, as a reflection of long pent up Palestinian Arab frustration about what they perceive to be um, a favoritism shown by European powers and the British in particular toward the Zionists. Um, by this point in time, by the mid thirties, we have really a fierce contest over the land between the Jewish and Arab sides with the British um, trying to figure out what is most expeditious for them? What is in their best interest? And it's not entirely clear. And that's why we see uh, very consistent, inconsistent policies uh, on the part of the British. Um, it's important to note that in this period of rising tensions between Jews and Arabs, there are voices of peace. Um, and even uh, before we uh, make our way to the mid thirties, um, we know of one very important um, group that arises known as Brit Shalom, uh, the Hebrew um, term for covenant of peace, uh, which is a, was a group of Jewish intellectuals, uh, largely of German origin, um, who took rise in 1925 to promote the idea of a binational solution uh, to uh, the growing tensions, one that would grant full equality to Arab and Jewish groups under a single state. And the leading figure uh, was actually an American reform rabbi uh, by the name of Judah Magnus, the leading figure in uh, these um, uh, small uh, uh, Jewish circles ag agitating for binationalism or for peace. Um, the leading figure was uh, Rabbi Judah Magnus, a reform rabbi who moved to Palestine in 1922 and who became the founding chancellor of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Um, it's important to note that Magnus, in terms of the political world of Zionism on the ground in Palestine, and Brit Shalom, an organization with which he was associated, um, were marginal um, in uh, the Jewish community in Palestine. Um, although the leader of the uh, Zionist uh, uh, organization in Palestine, David Ben-Gurion, did engage in a series of conversations uh, with Magnus over the course of the late 1920s and late 30s, uh, excuse me, early 30s. Um, Magnus is significant to us for another reason, uh, because he did draw to him a number of uh, leading uh, Jewish intellectuals who were very much drawn to a policy not of confrontation uh, and violence, uh, but peace. And uh, the person here uh, depicted to the immediate left of Judah Magnus um, 
uh, is a person about whom I want to speak uh, as we move towards conclusion. That is uh, Rabbi Leonard Bierman, um, here pictured in 1947 um, uh, at the campus of the Hebrew University on Mount Scopus. Um, in 1947, uh, Leonard Bierman, who was then uh, in his uh, penultimate years, the next to final year of rabbinical school at the Hebrew Union College, um, visited uh, the Hebrew University, uh, visited Palestine. His plans were to study at the Hebrew University, but he got swept up into um, a variety of activities um, there, um, including service in the Jewish paramilitary group known as the Haganah. Um, Leonard had come to Palestine already with a certain predisposition to pacifism, but he was swept up into uh, the activity of the Haganah in a time of um, even more heightened tension between the Jewish and Arab sides than had been seen in, in the mid-1930s. Um, because in 1947, the British announced their intention to uh, leave Palestine, to leave behind the mandate given by uh, the now defunct League of Nations. And the Jewish and Arab sides understood that it now was a fight between them. Leonard Bierman got swept up into that uh, spirit of warfare for a very brief period of time until um, he had to uh, launch a grenade um, and realized he couldn't do so um, and decided uh, shortly after joining the Haganah uh, to leave um, and to reaffirm his, uh, his earlier disposition and become uh, a full-fledged unquestioning pacifist, which he did from this point forward uh, until his last day. Um, it's important to note that Judah Magnus, whom we just mentioned, played a very important role in Leonard's own formation in the path of peace. Magnus was not only a pacifist himself, uh, but also a, a staunch opponent of all forms of ethnocentric nationalism. Um, and he himself was perhaps the most notable uh, Jewish opponent uh, of the idea of creating a Jewish state. Um, in 1947, 48. Uh, that is to say, he remained a believer in the idea of binationalism. Um, and Magnus's example remained um, extremely deeply imprinted on uh, Leonard Bierman. Leonard returned to um, uh, the land, which after 1948 became uh, the state of Israel several times uh, uh, after 1947, including in 1967, after uh, the 1967 or Six Day War. Um, um, in the wake of which Leonard um, wrote um, in a variety of settings, both in the journal and more publicly, um, uh, a number of things that I think are really uh, of interest to understanding his distinctive path uh, toward peace. Um, he said in a um, note to his journal, I feel uh, today a deep love for Israel, um, both the land and the people, even a deep yearning. And yet I do not share the intense national feelings which others have for it. So he was here separating between a deep sense of connection to his people, even to the Holy Land, uh, but without shorn of a kind of chauvinistic nationalism. Um, and indeed he asked uh, then in the wake of the 1967 war, should a state any longer be erected along lines of ethnic, religious, or racial preference? Um, Leonard um, sort of, built upon that um, uh, set of questions to develop a strong um, uh, connection to the Palestinian people and a strong commitment to securing justice for the Palestinian people. And one indication of this is a famous meeting that uh, Leonard had uh, with Yasser Arafat, here depicted uh, in the picture on the right. And then finally, um, <clears throat> as Salam mentioned, um, Leonard gave um, uh, uh, his final sermon on the 4th of October, 2014, several months before he died. Um, it was um, his usual slot at Leo Beck Temple, uh, which is to say um, he delivered the uh, sermon on Yom Kippur in the morning. Um, and it really was a culmination uh, of uh, 65 years or so of commitment to the cause of peace following his trip to Palestine in 1947. Um, and that subsequent period, uh, those decades uh, of service, were, were filled with uh, a commitment to uh, justice to, uh, to all inhabitants, and particularly the Palestinian people in, uh, uh, in the area. 
Uh, Leonard famously, memorably said in his last sermon, and here we are again, you and I, another Yom Kippur. He went on to say another war in Gaza, and then he said another 500 children of Gaza killed by the Israel Defense Forces with callous disregard for their lives. Um, he felt very passionately that war was uh, one of the great evils uh, of human existence. And he believed that his mission um, as a Jew and the mission of all Jews, as we see here, was to sanctify life because of the sacredness of every human being. Um, uh, in fact, um, Leonard was um, one of the great believers in that shared uh, Jewish and Islamic teaching that the loss of a single life is equivalent to the loss of the whole, wor whole world. Um, and so in conclusion, I think what we can see in Leonard is a deep commitment to uh, his faith, to his people, uh, to the sanctity of the lives of all people, uh, but shorn of any trace of ch chauvinism or supremacy. Um, and with that, I am going to uh, bring an end to my presentation and open up for our conversation. Well, that was a, a fabulous journey, uh, David, in such a short period of time. I think you covered so much, and I think that's the, uh, the sign of a, of a great uh, teacher uh, and uh, a great historian as, uh, as, as you are. Um, I, have a, I have a few questions, and then uh, I have my colleagues who are joining who can uh, raise their hands or uh, write their questions in the chat space. Uh, and we'll, we'll let them join the conversation uh, after a few minutes. If we go to the uh, root definition of Zion, um, this love for Zion, my understanding is that the love for Zion is equated with the love for Jerusalem. Is, am I correct? Yes, and yes, um, in the most um, immediate geographic sense. Um, but when um, ancient, medieval, and even modern Jews spoke of the impulse of Shivat Zion, the return of Zion, they had in mind a larger kind of metaphorical understanding of uh, a return to uh, the Holy Land uh, writ large. So the land around Jerusalem. The Holy Land. Um, the the land, Holy Land. I mean, here... We had, we, we get into, you know, something that, um, you know, uh, in a certain sense is part of the nature of monotheism. Jews believed that the Holy Land was promised uh, to uh, the descendants of Abraham, um, of which they saw themselves. Um, and it's really important to note that um, the idea of the impulse to return to Zion is deeply embedded into daily Jewish liturgy. But when Jews intoned those words, calling for a return to Zion, they often had in mind a return to a world, a pristine world of justice and equality. Um, a small number had in mind a physical land um, that they could attach the name Zion to. Uh, much more common was that metaphorical understanding of Zion. It's the Zionist movement that came and really concretized what Zion meant in this very specific territorial way. And that leads to my second point or question, and, and that is that there's a religious aspect of Zion, and then there's that political uh, manifestation of it. And, and I saw that in your presentation. Uh, I don't know if you intended that or not, uh, but, uh, but Herzl w was, was a secularist. He, he was not a religious person. So that aspect of Zionism became very political, whereas the religious form of Zionism is something that we as Muslims ex uh, uh, accept. In other words, uh, that Jews have a right uh, to be protected uh, in and around uh, the Holy Land uh, as, as part of our religious obligation. So we see no uh, no tension there, no, no, no conflict there. But when it becomes a political movement, you know, and I think the same thing uh, is said about what we call political Islam, uh, then, then that's where conflicts uh, arise. And so political Zionism uh, 
is very different from religious Zionism from my standpoint. Yep. I just want you to comment on that. Sure, sure. So yes, um, uh, Herzl was really intent on the proposition that Zionism would transcend uh, traditional Judaism, which is why Zionism was vigorously opposed by many traditionally observant Jews, especially in Eastern Europe. Um, and yet, as we saw, as is very characteristic of nationalist movements, Zionism wrapped itself in re religious symbolism. It, it harked back to the ancient homeland. Um, the um, members of the second wave of Zionist immigration uh, spoke of uh, physical labor as um, almost a religion. Um, so they deployed um, the symbols of religion, the language of religion, in order to um, render their mission holy in some sense or sacred in some sense, even though many of them were secular. Um, now, in addition to that, I mentioned that Zionism was born in multiplicity. Um, there was the largely secular political Zionism of Herzl. There was this kind of practical uh, till the soil approach of the Eastern European Jewish uh, immigrants. There also emerges about five years after the first Zionist Congress in, 19, in 1897, a group called Mizrahi, um, which uh, saw itself as a group of religious Zionists whose aspiration was to create in Palestine a society and then later state um, whose constitution would be the Torah. It's important to note that when they took rise, when the Mizrahi took, movement took rise in uh, 1902, it was a very small minority of religiously observant uh, Jews, many of whom opposed Zionism because they believed that it was an attempt to, in a sense, push the hand of God to commence the messianic process, the process of messianic return to the homeland. And it's important to note that throughout the 20th century, um, there remained um, a very um, strong contingent of religious Zionists who opposed, uh, excuse me, of religious Jews who opposed Zionism, who believed it was a kind of profanation uh, of God's name, that it arrogated to human beings what was rightly uh, God's um, uh, decision, God's prerogative. Um, so what all of this is to say is that the relationship between religious and politics is very tricky. Um, um, Herzl certainly tried to secularize Judaism into a national movement. Um, what is so striking today, I would say, um, when we look at what goes by the name Zionism, is that that largely has been turned on its head uh, because the most pronounced and ideologically coherent form of Zionism today is religious Zionism, um, which um, builds on the ethos of settling the land, but really renders it um, uh, as um, an act of divine will. Um, something which would have made Theodor Herzl very uncomfortable. Um, and yet, in a certain sense, Herzl set in motion that exact process. Um, I, I know this is, is too much to, to uh discuss in this session, but I, I'd be interested to, you know, if, if you could characterize the status of Jews in the Muslim world uh, before political Zionism, uh, we, know, we know what the status is now. I mean, it's, it's terrible, but um, how, how, how was the state of, of Jewish communities in Palestine, in, in the Middle East, in Turkey, in, in Muslim majority uh, areas before political Zionism. Yeah, that you'll bring me back for a whole other lecture on that. Topic. I know we need we need you to come back to talk about that. On one foot, as we say. Um, yeah, so I think if we talk about the medieval period, the period you know from the time of the rise of Islam uh, through um, the 18th century. Um, if I were to generalize in gross fashion, I would say the treatment of Jews under Islam was better than the treatment of Jews under Christianity, um, uh, which isn't to say it was sublime and wonderful um, universally throughout the Muslim uh, 
world, it wasn't. Um, I mean, the, answer, the simple answer to your complicated question is it's a mixed bag. Um, but what I would say is that uh, Islam and Judaism did not have the same intensity of familial relationship that Judaism and Christianity did. Christianity emerges directly out of Second Temple Judaism, and there's tremendous tension that um, issues from the relationship that develops. Um, Islam and Judaism uh, did not have that same, whether it's parental or sibling relationship, it was more like a cousin relationship. Um, so there wasn't that same intensity. And as we know, um, Jews had protected, albeit second class status as dhimi um, uh, uh, under Islam. And the long and short answer is that in some realms or later countries, that status was um, uh, a, quite a good status, uh, quite um, a favorable, sta favorable status. Um, beginning in uh, southern Spain and Andalusia, um, and extending up to some uh, to the Ottoman Empire in some of its uh, uh, periods. Um, in other regions, Yemen in the um, uh, 12th and 13th centuries, uh, to be uh, uh, a dhimi uh, was to uh, have uh, a decidedly subordinate and often persecuted status. Um, so it's a mixed bag. Um, as we make our way into the modern era, um, here too it's a mixed bag. Um, we know that, for example, in a place like Baghdad, Jews constitute up to one third of the city um, in the early 20th century and are amongst the uh, cultural, uh, social, economic, and political elite of the city. Um, in other parts of uh, the Muslim world, for example, Iran in uh, the late 19th and early 20th century, um, there's an altogether different status uh, for Jews, um, and there are important differences between uh, uh, the Sunni and Shiite worlds as well that we could bring into, bring into play. North Africa um, is its own world, um, and there's a rich and often glorious Jewish history there um, that begins to sour not just in the 1940s, but um, also with the advent of uh, nationalism and the introduction of anti-Semitism, European anti-Semitism into the Middle East in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So um, it's a mixed bag. Um, there are indeed um, sites in which Jews can live um, very um, uh, productive um, and, and comfortable and safe lives uh, in the Arab and Muslim worlds and sites where they can't. Um, but the nature of their existence really does change in, in the 1940s as the pace of a confrontation between Zionism and uh, the Arab world uh, really picks up. And, and, the, and the word limmi, uh, by definition, is the protected, You're my honor. And, and so um, that was the intent. However, as you said, um, the way it was applied, or it, it may have varied uh, uh, throughout the region, depending on various political, sociopolitical uh, circumstances. Um, and, and, and what we see today in, in terms of the conflict, as you said, is mainly due to uh, the situation in, in, in Palestine um, and the, the Zionist movement. Um, then um, in, in, if we, you know, we don't have time to go over all these points, although again, I think we got to bring you back to talk about uh, more of it. But if we go to the Belfort Declaration now, why did Belfort make the declaration? I mean, what was his, I mean, the, the, the you know, the perception is okay. He was he was lobbied by Herzl and uh, Weissman and, and and the Zionist movement. Um, but what at the end was the British interest in the Balfour Declaration? At the end of the day, it is decidedly unclear what the interests of the British were in issuing the Balfour Declaration. Um, you know, in in a counterfactual world, uh, perhaps the British would have taken back their declaration. Uh, given how it turned out for them in Palestine. Um, amongst the explanations um, are, one, um, Lord Balfour was a religious man um, and um, belonged to an emerging uh, uh, sentiment in uh, already the 19th century known as Christian Zionism, um, uh, whose 21st century 
heir um, is, I think, Christian evangelical um, uh, uh, constituencies. Um, and had, you know, as uh, part of his Christian Zionism, uh, this notion that uh, the Jews should be restored to the Holy Land as part of uh, the ultimate eschatological process that would lead to the second coming of Jesus. So that's one strand. Another strand says that there was some measure of guilt over um, uh, the, and concern over the relatively unprotected status, to use your term uh, protected, unprotected status of Jews during the First World War, uh, when Jews did not have uh, the protection of a state to, uh, to assure their well-being, um, and uh, were pushed back and forth between uh, uh, allied uh, uh, forces um, and, uh, uh, and the Germans, uh, German allied forces, um, throughout the war. Um, so there was some measure of guilt perhaps attached to their religious sensibilities about the status of Jews. And um, Zionism was seen as a solution, particularly for Eastern European Jews, um, who were the primary victims, uh, Jewish victims during the First World War. And then there is a sentiment um, that also was present um, in the world in which Balfour lived, um, in which there was a desire to rid Europe of Jews. Um, um, a kind of quaint uh, or not so quaint uh, whiff of anti-Semitism that said Zionism is the solution um, uh, uh, to rid us of Jews. Theodor Herzl, I should note, was aware of this um, and not only shared a solution, but sometimes even diagnoses of Jews. Jews are dependent and, uh, and excessively cerebral and unproductive, and the solution is to get them out of Europe. That was a solution shared by early Zionists and anti-Semites. Um, and so that may well have been part of it as well. Um, we can't discount uh, the intense lobbying by the Zionist organization, as you mentioned, and Chaim Weizmann. So I think those four factors together give us some uh, plausible explanation. You know, we do know that five years later, when uh, a junior secretary kind of issues a clarification of the uh, Balfour Declaration, a man by the name of Winston Churchill, there's some, um, pulling back from uh, the Balfour Declaration, um, but not uh, to the point of withdrawing it altogether. There's some kind of recalibration. Um, it seems to me that you know, by the time we get to 1929 and the violence uh, that began in August of that year, uh, the British are very much regretting um, having gotten into Palestine and realized that um, there's much less uh, to be gotten out of it than they had thought. Then we get to the life of Rabbi Judah Magnus. And again, I find it fascinating and I, and I need to read more and, and hear you more uh, about uh, this uh, great figure uh, who was followed by Rabbi Leonard Grimman and he himself uh, had such a profound impact. And as you said, this is not a majority view by any means in the Jewish community, but definitely a profound one. Um, and, and so what, how should I put it, um, in, in terms of the situation in, 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 the, tw in the 20s and, and leading up to the creation of the State of Israel, uh, what was Rabbi Magnus's position after the creation of the State of Israel? Yeah. Um, so uh, Magnus was indeed um, an extraordinary figure, um, had a whole career um, in the United States as a leading reform rabbi, um, serving congregations in San Francisco and New York, um, and um, decided uh, in 1922 to pick up and to move to Palestine, um, which confounded virtually everyone in his life. Um, he... Um, felt himself drawn to um, the deep Jewish connection to uh, that place um, uh, to the point that he left a very comfortable uh, position um, at uh, a major uh, temple in New York. Um, he defied uh, the leadership and principles of the reformed 
uh, movement, um, which uh, at this point in time still held to uh, a position of, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, opposition to Zionism. Um, he was drawn by the spiritual fecundity of uh, Palestine um, and yet, and, and was a great institution builder. Um, he created, um, for all intents and purposes, the Hebrew University, including with a number of people uh, whom he did not get along with very well, uh, including Chaim Weizmann, who perpetually was trying to get him dislodged from his position as uh, a chief, as a, a, a chancellor of the Hebrew University. Throughout his life uh, in Palestine, um, and especially in his annual addresses to the student population at the Hebrew University, Magnus would articulate um, his vision of Zionism, his vision of Zionism, which was a vision based on full recognition of the national rights of both Jews and Arabs um, in the contours, of, in the confines of a, of a single, in the framework of a single state. Um, he outlined his views on pacifism uh, at a time of growing militarism and militancy in um, the, um, uh, the Zionist movement. Um, and therefore was regarded by some as an exceptionally brave and courageous person and by others as a foolhardy person. Um, I happen to belong to the former camp um, who regard Magnus as a man of extraordinary principle um, and commitment. Um, who understood the importance of talking to people with whom one disagrees, but never surrendering one's core ethical principles. Um, he was a leading figure in a series of movements that followed Brit Shalom, um, including the League for Jewish Arab Rappro Rapprochement, and then an organization called Ichud, which means union, um, and he testified before the Anglo-American Committee that came to investigate Palestine in 1944, I believe, um, and continued in his commitment to this idea of full equality between the Jewish and Arab peoples. And it's important to note, he didn't just focus on equality for all individuals, he was a believer in binationalism. Uh, he was a believer that there were two nations, uh, two cultural, spiritual nations, um, um, and also held to the belief that it was um, the most equitable political arrangement to accommodate the two cultural nations under a single uh, political frame. Um, along with that came his opposition to that which became the main talking point of the Zionist organization in Palestine after 1929, the idea of a Jewish state uh, with a Jewish majority. Um, and he continued with that up through 1948. Um, uh, I should know this, especially since I've written on uh, Magnus, but he died, uh, I can't remember exactly when, before the creation of the State of Israel, um, and therefore did not live to see it. Um, it is interesting to note that a number of his followers asked themselves um, after May 14th, 1948, after the creation of the State of Israel, what do we do? Um, do we surrender our binationalism and recognize reality? Amongst them was a very prominent figure by the name of Martin Buber, who posed this exact question. And some um, uh, continued to hold on to the view uh, that the only equitable arrangement was a binational uh, political frame, and others uh, accepted the reality on the ground, um, uh, acknowledged that there was a state of Israel, and sought to achieve uh, justice for Palestinian Arabs in other ways. So, to be clear, then, this is a, a Rabbi Magnus uh, was supportive of a one state, what we call a one state solution today. That's correct. That's correct. Um, and, 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 and so, this was the thinking, as you said, of a few individuals, probably not, not, not many but it had a profound effect. Uh, and now we, we, we go to Rabbi Leonard Bierman. Did he continue uh, with that philosophy? Did he, did he believe in that same idea of a binational state? He did not, um, first of all, he um, eschewed or um, 
um, set aside the designation Zionism for himself. He did not call himself a Zionist. Again, I want to just make clear that he felt a deep connection to the place. He felt a deep connection to the Jewish people, not just Judaism, the faith, but he did not call himself a Zionist. Um, and he was very much taken by the idea of binationalism in uh, 1947 when he was there, extending into 1948. Um, as you look at his writings over the course of time, um, he, um, I'd say through the, in the 60s and 70s, um, accepted uh, the uh, existence of the State of Israel uh, largely as a Jewish state um, and became um, an early advocate amongst Jews of the idea of a two-state solution, which in the late 60s and particularly 1970s was a radical idea because it entailed an acknowledgement there were, that there was such a thing as a Palestinian people, an idea that had really been suppressed for decades and decades. So one has to sort of follow the drift of, um, of discourse of progressive Jews. Um, when he was in Palestine, he fell under the sway of, uh, of Rabbi Magnus, and I think was very much taken by the idea of binationalism. Um, in the 60s and 70s, he fastened onto the idea of uh, acknowledging the rights of the Palestinian people to self-determination, which um, in that period and in an organization like Breira um, really took the form of a two-state solution. Um, I think were Leonard with us today, um, he would be asking him, uh, he would be asking that question uh, that he posed uh, in the wake of 1967, which is, should there be a state should a state possess kind of ethnic or religious markings in the way that the state of Israel does? Now, in other places in 1967, Leonard affirms his commitment to the state of Israel as a Jewish state. But that was Leonard. He was always questioning his own presuppositions as well. Um, my assumption is um, that um, uh, were he w still with us today, he would... Um, be imagining that the era of the two-state solution um, was over um, and that it might be time to revisit um, some of the ideas that uh, he and Rabbi Magnus um, entertained um, 70 years ago. Um, that's my surmise based on sort of what I know of as Leonard's um, kind of ability to um, adapt and be introspective while holding down as the core uh, the quest for justice for uh, the Palestinian people, which I think was um, his paramount concern um, from um, you know, 1940-48 on. Once he understood that the Jews had achieved a measure of self-determination, I would say that was his paramount concern. It took on different political um, uh, uh, forms over the course of time, but I think um, there might have been a pendulous swing back to that era of Magnus. And um, in, in for today, is this idea of a one-state solution, a binational state, is it growing, um, or is it does it remain, you know, very very rare uh, in the Jewish community? Yeah, I would say um, yes. Um, I'd say it's growing, and I would say it's still a minority position. Um, uh, still, um, a majority of Jews. Um, when polled, certainly in the United States, um, uh, favor the two-state solution. Um, and I would say there's, you know, kind of a, uh, 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 what should we say, a reticence to, to recognize um, that, um, that that solution may have been rendered impossible by uh, the settlement project that followed the 1967 war. Um, so there's a kind of belatedness, which is one of the terms that the scholar Tony Judd famously used in describing Zionism in general, a belated uh, nationalist movement. Um, I think things are, things are shifting on the ground. Um, there are both the realists who say it may no longer be possible, um, and I suppose those informed by uh, some measure of ideological or moral sensibility that says that may not be the most equitable solution uh, for all of the people involved. 
um, at this point. Um, and that sentiment is partic particularly evident amongst the young, um, where I think we see increasingly an openness to, um, uh, to entertain um, the idea of a solution other than uh, uh, the long regnant two-state solution. I should say that I, for my part, have held to the view that the two-state solution is the worst solution except all the others, uh, as Churchill famously said of democracy. Um, but um, I'm not certain uh, that it's possible any longer. Um, and um, in light of that, um, uh, that lack of certainty, I think we are obligated to enter into a new period of political imagination to come up with um, various alternative schemes, uh, alternative schemes that can allow for peace, justice, and equality for all, um, and especially attend to the long deferred quest for justice of Palestinians. So I think we need to enter into a period of new political thinking. And part of that, I think, is to revisit some of the ideas that were present in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, including um, uh, the ideas of, of, of Rabbi Magnus. Um, but there are also ideas that emerged um, that are sort of resurfacing, ideas of a confederation or a federation or um, uh, other related ideas. Um, and I think we don't have the luxury uh, of holding to just one idea. I think what we need is a new marketplace of ideas that will inspire political imagination, um, really animated by the principle of, uh, of justice and equality for all. Uh, and, and Rabbi Bierman was, as we mentioned earlier, um, was involved in many uh, anti-war movements. Uh, he was uh, part of the movement against nuclear uh, proliferation and for nuclear disarmament. Um, he was involved in, in, the, in the movement against the Vietnam War. He, he was uh, involved with us in the movement uh, against the first Gulf War back in 1991. Uh, as well as the second uh, Gulf War. And he's outspoken uh, 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 on the issue of um, as what he called the disregard for Palestinian lives uh, in what was happening in Gaza uh, on so many occasions. Um, tell us about his work. I, I believe he was a member or if not founder of the Rabbi, Rabbis for Human Rights. Yeah, yeah. So it's important to say that Leonard after that experience with the Haganah became a confirmed and really unveering pacifist throughout his life. And that was, in a certain sense, um, the guiding principle of his life and of his Jewish life, um, the belief that every human being is created in the image of God. That was Leonard's theology in you know, one sentence. Um, and you know, that's why he joined forces with people like George Regis and uh, Jim Lawson, who shared his commitment to pacifism, um, which is you know, hard to hold on to in you know, in the face of the drumbeats of war. Um, but Leonard sought to infuse all of his Jewish teaching and all of his Jewish organizational work um, with that impulse. Um, and indeed was amongst the founders of Rabbis for Human Rights, um, an organization that, um, um, uh, whose main mission was to, uh, to promote uh, the uh, suppressed human rights of, of Palestinians um, in, in Israel-Palestine. Um, Leonard also uh, became involved with uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, um, um, even though um, he didn't necessarily subscribe to um, all of its um, uh, guiding principles, but he felt uh, that Jewish Voice for Peace was um, an important articulation of the principle of pacifism. <clears throat> um, and um, I should say that his pacifism um, you know, especially in the face of concern that um, Israel was under perpetual threat, uh, dwelt in the midst of a constant Arab siege, um, earned him no great groundswell of support within the Jewish community. Um, Leonard was reviled by many within the mainstream Jewish community, but unveering in his commitment to pacifism and, and also unwilling to surrender membership in the Jewish community. It's, I should say that that's one of the things that I most admire about Leonard. Um, he would not let anyone tell him, you don't belong here um, in the Jewish fold. Um, he was no less um, a legitimate stakeholder uh, as anyone else 
but he held to positions that nonetheless um, uh, made him uh, the target of uh, venom and vilification. Um, and I remember that <clears throat> um, in the wake of the Second Intifada, when many of us sensed that something had gone terribly awry, yet again, uh, we gathered together to uh, form a group called One Community, Many Voices, uh, to make clear that um, we too were stakeholders in uh, the glorious Jewish tradition, uh, but uh, we weren't going to um, uh, subscribe to um, a militaristic ideology um, and a disregard for human life. Um, and that really was um, the embodiment of, of Leonard's teaching and his, his organizational commitment. Tell us about your book, The Eternal Dissident. <laughs> um, so, over the course of um, many months and even several years, um, I tried to persuade Leonard to put together um, his sermons into a volume uh, because I had uh, seen many of them. Um, I um, had sort of spent a lot of time in his study, which you may recall, Salam, on the upper deck of uh, his and Joan's house. Um, and um, I knew what uh, extraordinary teachings, uh, what extraordinary manifestations of uh, the Jewish and moral uh, sensibility were, in, were really could be found there. Um, and I encouraged him to put together a collection of his writings and I would help him. And he said repeatedly, I'm just not sure. I don't know if my work adds up to a body of work worthy of this. Um, and it was that sentiment was really um, a reflection of genuine modesty, uh, not false humility. Um, and then a few years, a few, excuse me, a few months before he died, when he was um, in a enfeebled state, he finally agreed. He said, "Okay, um, I agree that we should. You, you can take the lead in putting something together." Um, and I began to work on it. Um, uh, and then Leonard died. Um, and uh, felt deeply committed to continue uh, this project of memorializing the teachings of this great uh, Jewish moral voice, this great human humanitarian, voice. yes, humanitarian, yes. And um, it was a really tough task to cull from 84 binders of his sermons, uh, 20 or so of the best. Um, but um, after some number of months, I came up with, I think, 25 uh, pieces of writing, most of which were sermons, um, and then asked 25 colleagues, friends, um, and admirers of, of Leonard, including you, um, uh, to write a brief commentary, 250 words or so, on a single selection of his writing. Um, and so what we have is not just this living testament to uh, uh, to Leonard's writings, but really a reflection of the way in which people have interpreted and carried forward Leonard's teaching in their lives. Um, and um, I encourage those of you who have not had a chance to encounter the teaching of Leonard Bierman to do so by, uh, by um, picking up a copy of The Eternal Dissident, which you can do uh, free of charge because we're really committed uh, to making this book available not only in print form, but in digital form uh, free and accessible to anyone. Um, so you can go to, uh, just look up The Eternal Dissident, Rabbi Leonard Bierman, and you will be taken to a website where you, you can download the book uh, and uh, spend time with it and really learn from a great moral master. That's The Eternal De Dissident, uh, Eternal by, Dissident by David Myers. Uh, Rabbi about... Leonard Bierman, edited by David Myers, available at University of California Press. Thank you, and you're, you're so right. I think uh, we love Rabbi Leonard Bierman and uh, what he's done, uh, not just for our community, but for all of society. Um, and uh, he's definitely uh, a, a, a towering figure in our community. And you can download the book, uh, as David said, or you can buy it uh, <laughs> and uh, help, uh, Help a little bit in terms of uh, David's career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the not going to be too much Read the book is what I would say. However you choose to do it, just read the book. Uh, I assure you, 
you will learn a lot, not just in terms of the Middle East, but uh, in terms of human rights. Uh, and as, uh, as David said, that moral voice that we're all uh, searching for um, in ourselves. And you will find, I assure you, will, it will help you find that voice within yourself. So, uh, and, and you know, we're so indebted to the, to the work uh, of Rabbi Leonard Bierman. Uh, David and I are both members of the uh, Leonard Bierman uh, Foundation that's run by Joan Bierman. Uh, and uh, we, we, uh, we're very blessed uh, to have uh, uh, that in our lives. And thank you very much, David, for your time. Um, this has been extremely, extremely uh, eye-opening, informative, uh, and inspirational. It, it gives us hope. And, and the way you did that through the historical um, analysis uh, is, was, was brilliant. So thank you, and I uh, hope to see you again. Okay, thank you, Fred. All right, take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye.